but I wanted to say um, hello everyone, Aniki Naweya, everyone, bienvenue tout le monde, and welcome to another FishCast seminar. My name is Dr. Christina Semenyuk, and I am the director of FishCast, which is an Insert Create training program that's meant to train the next generation of Canadian scientists in freshwater fisheries management and conservation. And we're the only freshwater fisheries training program right now in Canada that's specifically freshwater fish. So we're really, really excited about that. I am coming in from Treaty 2, also known as the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations, and that includes our, the Odawa, the Ojibwa, and the Potawatomi peoples. I am so privileged to be here as the beautiful sun is streaming through my window as I, as I hear the frogs and the, the toads chorusing and all the birds. I really am thankful for the privilege I, I've been given to not only live here, but to work here and do research, as well as in other places across the country. FishCast is it's not just a training program. We're really striving to be a community. And we're approaching our mid to later second year. It's a six year long program, but we really do have a mission to work with our graduate student trainees to move beyond land acknowledgements and more into the space of meaningful partnership and relationship building. And this type of meaningful relationships that acknowledge the history, connection to and knowledge of the land in which we're situated. We do have a goal through our outreach through our micro-credentials, through the seminars that we're holding right now to try to address systemic barriers in the field of fisheries and aquatic sciences and try to work with others to collaboratively find ways to overcome these systemic barriers. We're all treaty people and we're going to continue to be treaty land inhabitants. And so we're really, really excited to always bring in members of our fish cast community. Um, for example, Dr. Uh, Trevor Pitcher today to show you ways in which we really are trying to engage and, and to move beyond the basically the barriers of academia and into so many other really, really important avenues for freshwater fisheries, conservation and management. And so it is my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Trevor Pitcher today. He's a professor in um, the biology of integrative Integrated Biology, as well as the Great Lakes Institute for Environmental Research, otherwise known as GLEAR at the University of Windsor. Um, Dr. Pitcher is also the director of the Freshwater Restoration Ecology Center in LaSalle, Ontario. And beyond, again, to show this kind of membership and this community engagement, Dr. Pitcher is also membership, uh, a member of COSIWIC, and expressly the Freshwater Fishes subsection. And he's on the board of directors for IAGLER, the International um, Association for Great Lakes Research. But what does Dr. Pitcher do? Well, Dr. Pitcher studies freshwater fish reproductive systems, including sport fish stocking, hatchery practices, as well as the reintroduction of extirpated species. He takes on an advisory role, I would say, for the reproductive assessment of fish culture, as well as commercial aquaculture. Trevor's an expert on reproductive ecology of both wild and captive spawning population of fishes. And he is currently and has been working extensively to try to conserve native biodiversity. And this includes the reintroduction of species of risk, which not is always just about fishes, but about snakes and frogs as well. And it's equally important for Trevor to, to look after and to see to the health of economically important game fishes and to improve the sustainability of aquaculture. Trevor's lab is actually really highly collaborative and he has a number um, of collaborations and, and studies with other universities. So you can see here today from the call, he works with a bunch of different governmental organizations as well as indigenous communities, which is really, really important. Um, and the work that, that he does collaboratively has been amazing and I'm so excited to just always learn more about that. Uh, Dr. Pitcher performs extensive outreach through his uh, Freshwater um, Restoration Ecology Center and through himself as well. And he and his team are always keen to explore new co-engagement opportunities. And I just want to give a shout out to a recent example of Dr. Pitcher's impact in his field. And Trevor, I'm sorry if you're going to be mentioning it already, but I just wanted to, to highlight it again that Trevor and his team of grad students have used recently hormone induction trials to collect viable sperm from male and eggs from female red side dace. And this is a first for captive breeding of this endangered species. So indeed, Trevor is known by his colleagues as not only to be a very good friend, I consider myself included in that, but also a very good friend of fish culture. So we're proud to have Trevor as being a, an integral member of our fish cast community and we can't wait to learn more about reintroduction as a conservation tool for fishes. And so if you can please join me in welcoming Trevor today. Great. Well, thanks for that introduction. Uh, I better live up to it now. 
so I'm just going to just share my screen. If you bear with me here, uh, let's see if I want to share the whole screen or just part of the screen. Let's see. Does that work for you? Perfect. Good. Well, thanks again for that really warm introduction. And, uh, you know, a lot of things you mentioned are really important to me in our lab. So I always say our lab because a lot of the work I'll present today is based on students that have really worked hard in the lab and postdocs. And of course, a lot of the collaborators, we couldn't have done this work without including people at uh, Fish Culture and of course, uh, people at DFO and many other agencies as well. So welcome everyone. Thanks for having me today. I'm here today to tell you a little bit about uh, reintroduction as a possible conservation tool for fishes. And I'm going to go through some of the material relatively quickly, but a lot of this work is published. So if you're interested in some of the details, you can always check those out on our website. So as Tina uh, nicely mentioned, we've been working with this space of reintroduction biology for some time now, and it wasn't by accident that it happened, but it also wasn't completely intentional in the sense that a lot of the students really gravitated towards this idea. And so we first started working on reintroduction uh, when we were engaged in this program, along with many other partners, to restore, as you can see in the top left, Atlantic salmon to Lake Ontario. And then on the top right, we've also worked with a lot of American partners in terms of restoring, uh, you know, Lake Sturgeon into the Detroit River system, specifically over by Ohio. Um, so those are the two areas where we really got started on this. And as you'll hear today, we also started moving into uh, other species at risk as well. Then on the bottom, as Tina mentioned, students in the lab also work on frogs, shown on the bottom left. So one of my master students worked previously on frogs. This is a Mississippi gopher frog. And they literally have one pond left in all of North America. So, you know, we're talking about species at the brink of extinction. And then on the bottom right, I also have a PhD student working on Massasauga of rattlesnakes in terms of reintroduction back into the prairie ecosystem here in the Windsor Essex area. So we, we sort of migrated into this space somewhat, you know, fortuitously, and we've learned a lot over the last few years. And although we work mostly on fishes, as Tina mentioned, we have some interest in other species as well. So we're learning from each other as we all go through this process. So the goal today is to tell you a little bit about why we got interested in reintroduction biology as a whole. So we'll talk about, you know, how many, you know, vanishing fauna there are out there, whether it's frogs, snakes, or fish in this case. We'll talk a little bit about what is reintroduction. Reintroduction is a term that is broadly used, sometimes misused, and I'll try to define it carefully for you. And I think what's new today, to some of you may have seen some of the introductory material before in a previous lecture, if you've seen me, but what's new today is I'm really going to focus in and dial in on some of the real success we've had in relation to a case study that we're doing for Peel region right now. So we have a five year funded program and I'll explain that as we move through the talk. And then last but not least, uh, although I'm going to tout some aspects of reintroduction biology, I do want to temper the talk by finishing it off with some limitations and concerns about reintroduction and things we need to talk about further as we move into this space. So without further ado, let me introduce a few of the topics. And this is really kind of a couple of slides that explain why we really got excited about reintroduction biology initially. So we know, obviously, a lot of us on the call know that fauna are vanishing at an alarming rate. So whether it's plants or animals, but specifically in animals, the extirpation rate is incredibly high right now. And there's been a term called the Anthropocene defaunation, where we say that in the last couple hundred years, the rate of extinction or extirpation have been so high that they came up with this term because it's mostly human induced. And so this is something that a lot of us, you know, pay attention to and have been very interested in. And in 2015, I originally read this article, this journal article on the left that really focused in on this idea of what can we do about these vanishing fauna? And as you can see on the bottom left of the journal article on the left, this is a journal issue in science. They had a whole special issue about charting and reversing the decline of species. And that really caught my attention because I was keen on not just documenting the loss, which is what I've always heard about, but ideally doing something about reversing this decline. So this really was an intuitively uh, appealing idea to me. And I started reading about it much more carefully starting in about 2015. And so if you look at the special issue, and I'm not going to go through a lot of detail, but you can see that they sort of had a series of articles that really started laying down the framework for the idea of restoring species that have been extirpated. And in fact, if I highlight with red here, you can see, I'll just read a little bit to you. It says that some substantial progress in reversing defaunation is being achieved through the intentional movement of animals 
to restore populations. And it says we review the full spectrum of conservation translocations. So this really caught my attention because I knew from some of the work that fish culture and other were, others were doing with the ministry for you know restoring Atlantic salmon to Lake Ontario. I was very interested in how this worked for other species as well. So I started digging deeply into this literature. And what you realize is that conservation translocations are not entirely a new idea, but the formalization of the field is somewhat new. So you might be scratching your head and asking yourself, what are conservation translocations? Well, that's a broad term that, as the quote says, is a deliberate and mediated movement of organisms from any source, captive or wild, from one area to the free release in another. So this framework's been around since the 80s, but it hasn't been formalized until relatively recently. And what you can see on the bottom, for example, is a review by Swan et al. 2016 that really looked at marine related conservation translocations around the world. And what you can see in the color coding is the number of projects all over the world, ranging from light greenish blue, which represents one to five projects, up to greater than 50 projects, which is quite a number of projects in some parts of the world. So conservation translocations have been going on for a long time, but the actual field hadn't been formalized until more recently. And as I mentioned at the very start, sometimes people use the term reintroduction, you know, either incorrectly or they mean to say other things. So what I'll do now is just go through a couple of uh, slides to really kind of firm up what we mean when we say reintroduction. So there's a bit of a decision tree that they put together for defining these different tactics or strategies. And so let me just walk you through them. So on the top, it says, are animals to be released within historical range? If the answer is yes, you go to your left. If it says no, then you go to your right. And so what I'll do is I'll just go to the right first and deal with the no. So if the animals were not found historically in the region, we often refer to this as a conservation introduction or what they often call assisted colonization or there's a couple of other terms used for it, but essentially the idea here is that you're moving species into an area where they've never been before. And the example they give in this review is of a bird species shown on the bottom right, where they were essentially in big trouble because of mammal predation, and so they moved them onto an isolated island. So that's what we call assisted colonization to try to protect them from those mammals on the mainland. But if you follow the logic on the left hand side of the decision tree and where it says are the animals to be released within their historical range if the answer is yes they generally refer to this as some kind of population restoration and then there's a subcategory of decision that says are conspecifics or species of the same or individuals of the same species present in the release area and if the answer is yes you go to the bottom left and you can see that's what we refer to as reinforcement so the idea is that there may be some individuals, maybe a small population, so you're going to reinforce that. And a pretty well-known case is the black stilt on the bottom left. Or if there's no individuals or almost no individuals, they often refer to this as reintroduction. And some classic cases of this include the Puerto Rican crested toad, which the Toronto Zoo's worked on heavily, where they essentially went back to Puerto Rico to reintroduce captively bred individuals because there were almost essentially none left in Puerto Rico. And of course, you're probably more familiar with the gray wolf example on the west coast of North America. So today I'm really gonna focus on reintroduction, but please know that there are, of course, under translocation, there's reinforcement and of course, assisted colonization as well. But let's just take a quick look at reintroduction. So reintroduction, if I sort of holistically define it, is the process of releasing individuals back where they historically occurred, but they've become extirpated for the most part for a variety of reasons. So there might be different stressors, habitat degradation, over harvesting, invasive species, et cetera. And the goal of reintroduction biology in the holistic sense is to reestablish a self-sustaining population and ultimately have limited or no intervention. So the goal is not to be constantly managing the population, but to essentially set it up so that it can be successful on its own. And the second last bullet on the bottom says that this concept of reintroduction, and I put this in quotes myself, is relatively speaking quite radical because the concept means that if you're reintroducing a species back, it's pushing the line backwards by bringing a species that's been extirpated back to the ecosystem. So you're really altering the ecosystem. So relatively speaking, it's quite radical in terms of an ecosystem. So what's important to understand about this is that the terms have been around for a while, but this field of study is relatively new and there's so much to learn that this is why I think a lot of students are excited to get into this space because not only is there a possible 
applied outcome of success, but there's also a lot to do because there's so many fields or topics within the field that we don't have a lot of knowledge. And in fact, if you kind of scan the horizon for the textbooks related to this, you can see that they're the most recent textbook on the right, the reintroduction of fishes and wildlife populations only came out in 2016 and the original textbook on advances in reintroduction biology from New Zealand and Australia came out only a few years before that. So this is an incredibly recent, uh, you know, kind of topic that now has its own field and textbooks that students are starting to read at a regular pace. So again, reintroduction is, you know, a very complicated idea, but if you boil it down to the, the essence of it, what you need to do essentially is initially decide if the reintroduction is appropriate. And that has a whole lot of baggage built into that statement, but I'm going to just go with a simple statement that it, you need to decide, is it appropriate to reintroduce? And this varies a lot from species to species and of course taxa to taxa. But assuming you do assume, uh, sorry, assuming you do go forward with the reintroduction, you need to set uh, objective and measurable goals for that reintroduction. And of course, you also need to identify uh, obstacles to successful reintroduction. And then finally, you need to manage that introduced population, at least initially until it's self-sustaining. And the arrow on the right that goes back to the top is just referring to the idea that you adjust as you go or you adaptively manage reintroduction as you go. So, you know, there's a little bit of text here, but there's a lot of nuance behind that text that I won't go into today. So what I'll do now is just show you, in case you're not familiar with reintroduction before I get to the case study, what an idealized reintroduction looks like for a species. And what I'll show you really quickly is just this caricature or this very simple schematic of what a reintroduction may look like. So on your left, you'll see population size on the y-axis. So it'll go from relatively small on the bottom to relatively large on the top. And on the bottom, we have time. And time can mean you know, the order of years, maybe even decades, depending on the species you're working on. And at the top of the graph, you'll see that there's three kind of major stages. There's a time in the wild, there's a time in captivity, and there's a time when you're reintroducing back into the wild. So what I'll do is I'll just walk you through it fairly quickly. And so these are fairly common stages to different species. So the first thing that commonly happens, as you saw earlier in that journal issue, is that it's very common for species numbers to decline in the wild. So this dashed line represents a species that may be declining in the wild, so the number's going down over time. And as they precipitously decline, there's a decision made at some point, in many cases, to essentially bring some individuals in from the wild before there's either extirpation locally or even global extinction. And then what they do is they essentially create or found a captive population, and this captive population might be in a hatchery, it might be at a zoo, it could be in a variety of situations. And it says in the bottom, it says you found a captive population with either a source population or a populations with an S. And that little S in brackets there is really important at the bottom because deciding which source population to use or how many source populations you use to create this population is incredibly complicated. And it's a big decision to be made by a variety of stakeholders. And once you essentially have that in place, you grab individuals from the wild before they go extinct, you create this population, you grow the population up in your facilities, wherever they might be. And sometimes, once again, this reintroduction may not always be completely from a captive stock, but sometimes it ends up being. So you grow the captive population to a secure size. And as the population grows, you essentially have to essentially manage that population as the numbers persist. So once you get to a reasonably uh, stable population in captivity, what you can often do is then reintroduce them, which is the last major step on the right. And if you're following along, you can see that there's several arrows, one, two, three, four arrows pointing down. And what that's inferring or exposed to show is that the idea is that you end up doing multiple waves of reintroduction. So it's very rare for a reintroduction to take hold the very first time. So you end up doing several waves of reintroduction. And if everything goes well, the idea is that these individuals are released into the wild. So it goes from a solid line back to a dashed line and they become self-sustaining and ideally over time they would reproduce and create a population that at least mimics what the size of the old population was in the wild. And once again, there's a lot of nuances and they will vary from species to species and situation to situation, but that's the general uh, consensus for how an idealized reintroduction may work. And ultimately in the end, agencies, academics, many different groups will help manage the reintroduced population in the wild and this is what we ultimately are trying to aim these days with many of these freshwater fishes across Canada.
And in fact, we're very fortunate. I think I saw Carl even join us today, but Carl Amoth and uh, his team, which is at uh, the Drake Lab at DFO, put together an incredibly nice review of, with many collaborators looking at the possible use of reintroduction for species at risk fishes across Canada. So Carl and, and a variety of others got together and uh, essentially looked at where this has been suggested as a possible use of a tool that is to say reintroduction for a variety of species. And what you can see is that there's a variety of species shown in the top right, going from white sturgeon all the way down to channel darters. And essentially these are different species where the recovery strategy has suggested that reintroduction may be, and I want to emphasize may be, used in the future for conservation purposes. And in that entire list there, if you kind of squint heavily, you can see right in the middle there, I'll put it right around it, you can see that there's one species in particular that our lab's been very fascinated with for a long time, and that is the red side dace. So among this large group of freshwater fishes and a couple of marine ones, uh, red side dace is the one that we've really focused on the most. And in fact, as Tina alluded to earlier during my introduction, we've actually been part of a uh, reintroduction feasibility study. So I want to emphasize the feasibility study. So we're not doing a reintroduction, but assessing the steps needed to get ready for a reintroduction. And it's a five-year project from 2020 to 2025, working on red side dace, which as you probably know, are endangered in Canada. And this is a, in partnership with the municipality of Peel, because when they applied for a road widening project uh, permit, it was deemed that it was going to affect habitat needed by red side dace. And as a consequence, it triggered a overall benefits application for that permit. And the overall benefits uh, permit essentially just says that you need to do something positive for the species and mitigate any kind of habitat alteration that you're going to have. I'm sort of oversimplifying, but I'll show you a graph really quick of what the overall benefits rules kind of look like. And so when we did this, this was back in 2019 when it, the first application was put in for Peel Region. The idea again, and I'm just going to kind of briefly go over it, is that the Peel Region is going to affect some habitats, so they still have to mitigate this uh, kind of issue. So they have to mitigate the habitat uh, alteration, but the overall benefits permit says that you have to produce some kind of action that is going to benefit the species that's impacted beyond the simple mitigation. And so what was proposed was a research program to assess the feasibility of reintroduction into the future to help benefit red side days. And here's what I came up with with our team and our team came up together and said, well, how do we approach this? Because there are so many unknowns. So what we did is we mapped out several scenarios and we sort of put it into the simple diagram to try to explain what we would do over the next five years pending a variety of outcomes. So really quick, I'll just walk you through it. So at the top, it says you need to first you know, to assess feasibility, you need to confirm suitable translocation slash reintroduction locations. So that initially tells you we're not even sure if a translocation makes sense or a reintroduction makes sense. But next, you would then identify a donor population for either a captive population for reintroduction or a donor population for moving them as part of a translocation. And this is where it gets a little dicey. So we have to essentially monitor whether or not the population's allowable harm is exceeded or not. And what that means is, are we going to do more harm than good by drawing individuals from a source population for a translocation? Or is that allowable harm not going to be exceeded? So we had two different scenarios we didn't know the answer to. And uh, without going into too much detail, I sort of hedged my bets to the right-hand side of this graph where I said, based on what we know about red side days, it's probably likely we may exceed allowable harm and we probably won't be allowed to you know, translocate a large number of individuals needed. So instead, we sort of focused more in on how do we captively breed these individuals to bring the numbers of individuals for a possible trans a translocation or ultimately reintroduction up over time. So we really focused on that and then we essentially led towards a possible reintroduction experiment at the end of the five year period. So this is sort of the scenario that we sort of envision. And once again, a little bit of details I'm leaving out here, but we sort of hedged our bets on looking at captive breeding because our lab's really well known for working on reproductive ecology of fishes. So what I'll do in really a few minutes is just glance over some of these parts of this project, which is a five year study. And I will glance over some of the details, but again, a lot of this work is published, so you can check out the details if you like. But essentially the feasibility study had four major components. We had to find a suitable location for either grabbing or reintroducing the fish. 
We then had to look at some of the stressors in those areas, for example, thermal stress. We then did captive breeding, which hadn't been done before. And as Tina mentioned in the introduction, we just had success after several years of work. And I'll show you some of that work. And then last but not least, we proposed an experimental reintroduction. So not a full on reintroduction, but a small reintroduction effort to test the feasibility of reintroduction at the end of the five years. So let's start with uh, suitable locations. So I'm going to glance over some of the details, but it's been really fortunate uh, at the Great Lakes Institute to also have colleagues like Kat Febri on her team, including Bree shown in the middle here. So Kat Febri is on the right, Bree's in the middle, yours truly on the left. And the idea here is that we're starting to look at some of the habitat characteristics of streams where red side dace are found and then close by streams where they're not found to start trying to tease apart using a reference model what are the key characteristics of the habitats they require? And this wasn't really possible without Kat and her team. We also went around and tried to assess what streams actually had red side dace because one of the requirements is that you can't overlay a reintroduction to an area where red side dace already exist. So one of the tools we also used is we had students from GLEAR go out and assess uh, you know, different streams all across the Toronto region based on eDNA, so that's environmental DNA. So you can see Ryland here is one of my former students who also worked with myself and Chris Wilson, and he went out and grabbed a bunch of water samples and essentially was able to look at all these different streams across the GTA to see for the presence and absence of red side days using this new technique called environmental DNA. And really simply put, he just grabs the water sample, which actually looks easy, but he spent a lot of hours collecting those, especially in the winter. And then you essentially filter the water in the field through, a, you know, essentially a coffee like filter. And then after you get the coffee filter, you essentially fold it up, throw it into a tube and a preservative, and you can take it back to either lab here in Windsor or at the ministry lab and actually look for uh, remnant samples of DNA to determine whether or not red side days had been in that stream, at least recently. So that's what we spent a lot of time doing. And we spent a lot of time mapping out across the entire range of Ontario that we assessed whether or not red side dates were found. And here's just a small sampling of what this looks like. So this is just shows you a bunch of different uh, streams, Levi, Hottonville, Springbrook. Some of you probably know these streams, Fletcher's. And what we can do is essentially get a different level of detection from five copies per reaction, all the way down to a non-detection. And then what this does is the environmental DNA really just sort of pinpoints not an absolute answer but sort of uh, helps us pinpoint areas we may want to send a team out to put in cameras or do other kind of sampling to assess whether or not species are in that area specifically in this case red side days so not only are we looking at habitat quality but we're also looking at where the species is as sort of an update to some of the efforts that have been done by others as well and then i mentioned also we don't want to just you know, reintroduce species back to an area where it's too stressful. So we also look at some of these stressors and we have a variety of students and postdocs that have looked at stressors for red side days. This is actually Andy Turco, who's a former postdoc in our lab, who's now at McMaster University. Uh, incredibly uh, you know, fortunate to have Andy work with us. He's incredibly talented. And what Andy did is he assembled a team of students and essentially looked at a particular stressor. He focused in on thermal stress. And what he did is he did some work in our lab, but also in the wild to look at red side days thermal limits um, in terms of what they call CT max. So Andy was essentially assessing whether or not the fish could deal with different temperatures of water, which is a big deal in an urbanized setting like Toronto, where stormwater management might be affecting temperature profiles for these different streams. So here's a little snapshot from one of Andy's publications. You can see on the Y axis is CT max. And CT max, if you're not familiar with it, is sort of the maximum temperature before the fish kind of turns over on its side, essentially right before it's lethal. And what you can take home from this, and Andy looked at them at different times of the year, uh, is that you can see that there's different thermal maximums at different times of the year, which is very interesting. And you can see there's subtle differences between juveniles shown in the yellow on the left, and then there's some differences sometimes between males and females, depending on the season. And as, because Turco's so talented, Andy's so talented, he didn't just leave it at looking at this at a correlational standpoint. He also experimentally manipulated these fish in our captive breeding center. And what he did, which is really clever, is he altered the ration or the food input for these animals. And he found that by essentially giving the red side dace more food, 
they had the ability to essentially persist longer in higher temperatures. And this is doesn't seem like a big deal when you see only one or two degree difference, but this could be the difference between life and death for these red side days in the greater Toronto area. So in this very simple diagram, you can see on the left that essentially he shows that the ration or the food input did significantly alter um, the adults ability to persist, but not the juveniles. So this is a big deal because this allows us to say that, you know, any kind of restoration effort that's done in the area that helps promote more insect biomass, maybe helping this species persist. So this was one of the big outcomes from Andy's work. But Andy, of course, didn't leave it there. He also worked closely with a few collaborators, including uh, yeah, Andrew Drake and Nick Mandrak and, of course, Graham Scott, and more importantly, a colleague of his, Alexandria LeClaire, who also worked on CT Max at the same time. And Andy and her got together and they sort of formalized some of this work into a larger model to try to choose source populations for possible reintroduction based on their ability to deal with thermal tolerance. So once again, glancing over the details, but the main point here is that you can see in the bottom left that there are three distinct geographic uh, isolated populations from a genetic standpoint that have been identified previously, and they actually have quite different characteristics in terms of their thermal tolerance. And Andy nicely pulled that together and sort of made uh, hypothesized what would be the ideal populations for possible reintroduction in the future based on where you were going to do it. So this is something you can check out if you're interested, and this is a publication from 2021. And then, of course, as I mentioned, we also wanted to look at this idea of captive breeding as part of this five year project. So we needed to ask a few questions. The first one was before we do captive breeding in our lab, we often go to the wild and observe what wild spawning looks like so we can mimic that during the captive breeding process. One of the big things our lab have done over the last 15 years is try to increase the presence of ecology and evolution into the spawning regiment, even in hatcheries for somonids and other species, and try to improve the fitness of species. And the only way to do that is to study what they do in the wild. We also here in LaSalle, as Tina mentioned in the introduction, we have an experimental research population of red side dace in captivity that we brought from Ohio. So we can do things with this research population that we can't do with animals in the wild. And of course, because they're in captivity and we want to learn how to captively breed them, the third bullet says that we often end up having an environmental mismatch. And what this means is that we're missing a bunch of cues that allow them to breed in the wild. So in captivity, we had to manipulate the temperature. So the profile of the temperature in the water, we had to manipulate the light cycle. We had to manipulate whether or not the presence of host species are there because red side days spawn into other fish's nests, as you may know. And last but not least, we also manipulated their condition. So we actually fed them more or less as part of the experiment as well. And ultimately, we injected these fish with hormones to try to induce them to spawn in captivity. And the punchline, thankfully, was after four years of effort, it finally worked really well this year. So it took four years of iterations to get it working incredibly well. And I'll show you some of these results now. And as I said, before we do the breeding, we often look at what happens in the wild. So one of our PhD students, Ashley Watt, uh, looked at this in the wild. So you can see Ashley on the left there with one of our 3D printed models of red side days. And she had incredible persistence and went out to the wild in the Toronto area with help from Erling Holm and Dave Lowry. And she actually filmed, fortunately, a huge number of spawning events with the red side days. And I'll show you the video really quick. And what you can see here is in a couple of seconds, you'll see three individual red side days come to your forefront on the left and spawn quickly. There they go there. And she captured 72 different spawning events after many hours of footage from the wild. But you can just see incredible footage of spawning behavior in these days. And what she noticed that was fascinating, and this is a still image from the video we just watched, is that in many cases, females, you can see on the bottom left, there's a female in the middle and two males. So she found out that sometimes females mated with multiple males and occasionally they mated with a single male. And they did this in this kind of, uh, how do I say, individual sense. They kind of break off into a small group and spawn, but sometimes there was just a frenzy of individuals. So they would you know, they essentially spawn in this incredibly large group. So she really learned a lot about the spawning system or the mating system of the red side dace. And we applied this to some of the captive breeding efforts that are going on uh, currently. So as I mentioned, we actually manipulated the environment, the light, 
the water temperature and we used hormones. And for the first time, we really, you know, we've gotten eggs before, we've gotten sometimes sperm, but we've never had it all come together. And this is just pictures from literally two weeks ago. So this is fresh, uh, fresh off the presses, as they say. So we got the females shown on the top left. Those are my dirty fingernails, which is kind of gross, but I apologize. But we got the fish to spawn. Uh, we extruded the eggs from the females and then put the females back in the tank. They were fine. And then we fertilized the eggs seen in the top right. And then on the bottom right, I can tell you that we actually have the fish now on feed for the first time ever. So they're now taking food and growing quite quickly. And we have several hundred of these now growing in captivity. So what we're trying to say is that the feasibility of captive breeding is now real because we can now essentially come up with a protocol from this work that Ashley's done to show others how to breed these in captivity. And I'll talk a little bit later about the capacity to do this within the province of Ontario and how we could improve that. And then last but not least, as part of this Peel project is we had proposed an experimental reintroduction. So not a full fledged one, but a small experimental reintroduction. And the rationale behind this was to look at the probability of success over some of the issues. What are some of the issues, excuse me, that we're going to discover as we do a small reintroduction effort? So we want to be careful about the unintended possible consequences that may come from a reintroduction. So a small experimental one may help us uh, highlight issues related to disease, genetics, ecosystem changes that may come from the reintroduction. So we're very mindful of these. And it also allows us to develop post-release monitoring techniques to say, what are we going to measure after we release these fish? How are we going to do it? And what are the key metrics for possible success? And one of the last things you realize very quickly as you do this work is that we have a collection of scientists that we work with, but sometimes we always forget that the social dimension dimensions of reintroduction are rarely explored. So we really have to be mindful of the socioeconomic, the social, the public perception of reintroduction. And this is something that we need to work on as well as genetics, for example. So I highly advocate those of you interested in those dimensions to really uh, reach out if you're interested in working on those with us. And in the last bit, what I will tell you is that we're also fortunate before we do this experimental reintroduction is we have a several steps we kind of need to check off before we can even consider doing it. And one of the first steps, as you might think about, is the possibility of transport stress from a captive setting or from another location to a possible reintroduction site. So we're fortunate enough to have people like uh, Dr. Christine Madliger, who's a new fish cast member, a postdoc working with all of us, myself and Steve Cook. And we also have Ashley uh, Watt, who's a PhD student, where they'll be working together along with Andy Turco, kind of a great team, working together, looking at the possible effects of transport stress on red side days where they look at it after one hour transport, two hours and four hours. And I won't go into the details, but they're gonna look at a lot of behavioral metrics and things like thermal stress as a realistic proxy for stress after their transportation. And just wrapping up, I do wanna emphasize again that uh, you know reintroduction sounds like a great tool, but there are many challenges to reintroduction. So I've sort of you know really touted the you know potential benefit of reintroduction, but I do wanna temper it by saying that reintroduction comes with real issues. First, it's very expensive. Uh, it took me four years just to get the captive breeding working. Uh, so it is expensive and sometimes it can be ineffective. So other case studies of other fishes sometimes show that it doesn't work well. We know that the risks can be numerous or even more importantly, unknown. So these are things we need to think about carefully. The third bullet says, there, you know, there's no real capacity currently for captive breeding. I'm doing it in a relatively small facility, research facility. But is there a possibility of working with, let's say, provincial agencies like fish culture to take advantage of the incredible knowledge that all these different hatcheries around the province have to essentially do captive breeding for species at risk? I watched my colleagues in fish culture do incredible work with bloaters and Atlantic salmon and many other species up north and down south. And with that kind of expertise, can we essentially create a large number of red side dates, let's say, for possible reintroduction? Last but not least, of course, there are real policy issues that need to be tackled, and this is something that is uh, ongoing with a lot of reintroduction questions. And so our colleagues in policy are working hard to find ways to, you know, decide if this works or not. And last but not least, uh, you know, the real question for me is that we need to do this carefully, and a lot of my colleagues agree with this, that reintroduction, we don't want to rush into it. But one of the challenges of reintroduction is that if we wait too long, a species like red side dace may be gone from Canada. So the question is, do we wait? How careful are we? You know, how long does it take before we actually do the reintroduction or not? 
And if we wait too long, we do risk losing the entire population within Canada, of course. And so, of course, there are solutions to that. So, you know, one thing we proposed very early on is a postdoc of mine, Ian Butts, developed a methodology to actually cryopreserve sperm, that is to say genes from Canadian populations in case of possible extirpation. And so there are ways that we can actually genome resource bank, that is to say put away genes for later reintroduction and captive breeding if we so choose. So these are all sorts of issues related to reintroduction that are coming up during this feasibility study. So in conclusion, I really appreciate everybody being here today, but I hope you got something out of the talk. The main thing I hope you got from it is that reintroduction as a tool, whether it's frogs, fish, snakes, is becoming a more common consideration. And so we need a lot more research in these different areas. Experimental captive research populations, I, I'm trying to tout as a very good way to learn a lot more about the species we're trying to preserve. Uh, I will also tell you that choosing source populations is a very complex issue. There's a very nice review uh, out there by Brian Neff and his previous PhD student, Amy, who essentially looked at this and you can see that there's a real complex issues, not just with the genetics, but with other facets as well. And importantly, for those of you interested in this field of reintroduction biology, it's a new field and there's many knowledge gaps. So there's lots of space for different groups working on genetics all the way to social science to collaborate together on this. And again, I left out some of the details, but if you have any questions, you can check out our lab, which is shown at the bottom left, the website, or you can always check out some of our Twitter feeds where we show some of the results from the work we've been doing lately. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions anybody might have. Thanks so much, Thank Trevor. Really, really appreciate it. And thanks everyone. Yes, please join me in thanking Trevor for that talk. Fantastic. We're gonna stop recording now and we're gonna open